Mikey would egg him on <laughs> and just absolutely torment him beyond. Like he would, it, it literally. I can't tell you how many times he would come in and pull the garage doors down and said, "You both are fired. Get the f out of here." He says, "We're done. We're not racing this week." I'm, you know what I mean? I mean, like he go over, open the garage, open the garage door. We're back open for business. He come back, close the dang, <laughs> dang door. Hi, I'm Greg Zibadelli, and this is the Derek Pernus Siglia Show. Can I drive you? Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Derek Pernasiglio Show, and we have a very special guest. He is the Chief Competition Officer at Stuart Haas Racing, multi-time NASCAR Cup Series Championship Crew Chief, uh, just a, a household name in auto racing, and also the co-host of Drop Zone on the Outdoor Channel, Greg Zipidelli. Thank you for coming in. This is amazing. It's great to have you. No, I appreciate it. This is fun. Uh, glad you... Uh invited me uh, i've been watching your stuff for a while and and, and love your work thank you I, I appreciate it we uh we just have fun all we do is just sit down and just do some bench racing and some <laughs> some you know bullshitting and yep. that's all we're gonna do but uh yeah uh clyde was 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 busting my chops clyde mcleod he you yeah. gotta get zippy on the show you gotta get scotty on the show because you know he said that they lived it with you guys you know growing up uh in uh in berlin clyde was uh you know <clears throat> he was uh uh, like an uncle, like a big brother. Um, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with with with, with Clyde on the road as an, as a younger you know man racing modifieds, and he really uh, helped me get into it and kind of made the transition. And when he left and moved south, I kind of took over the modified stuff and then the, the Bush North stuff. So um, yeah, Clyde's been a big part of my life for a long time. Really enjoyed having him work with me the last ten years at, at Stuart Haas. Um, so it, it's fun to take full circle. But in actuality, though, you grew up in it. I mean, you were in the shop as kids, just like a lot of us too, right? Yeah, I mean, since since I can remember, um, five, six years old, um, it was in my, my father and Clyde built the motors. It was at our house in, in Berlin. Um, the, the modified was there that my uncle Billy owned. That's where I, I started. Obviously, it was it was um, Billy Carrazzo that that um, owned the car and. Um, my father, like I said, he, he in the early days he helped and build motors, and and then um, later on he had three kids to raise, and he worked at Sherry Cup, and then he kind of came back and helped um, a little later in the modified days in the late '80s when I was doing it, and and then the, the Bush North, so it was it, it was a lot of fun. But yeah, to see that ramp truck get loaded every every Friday night, Saturday night, and leave the yard, um, my mom would take us to the races, and we'd sit up in the stands and go down in the pits afterwards at, at five, six, seven years old. I, I was talking to my dad last night. I went over for Scotty's uh, son had a birthday, little birthday party over there last night. So we were talking about one of the first memories was they raced Plainville with Ronnie Bouchard, and uh, he woke me up about two in the morning with with the trophy, and they they had one they had one Plainville. It's a big deal. I was like, and I was like probably five or six, I think, at that time, and I I remember, I still remember that him walking in that night. They were so excited. They they I think they led just about every lap, and and. Uh, it was a big win for them. That was early on in the modified days. Was it one of those uh, national point races that counted towards? It's like a hundred lap or something back then, and yeah. Okay. Oh my God, that's that's <clears throat> crazy. But we all, you know, a lot of us came up like that. Um, but originally, uh, Clyde was telling me that your dad was a, a drag racing engine <laughs> builder first before anything, right? He liked a street race back in the in, in the day, back Berlin, <laughs> the Berlin Turnpike. You know, everybody would go up and. Um, you could you could get Billy on here and he'd tell you a couple of stories and how he bought that brand new Corvette and uh, my father took it apart and put slicks on it and Billy liked to Billy liked to own it but he didn't you know what I mean and he wanted to be part of it but and then he'd be like all right check you go you know let's go let's go race this guy let's go do this and he you know he's now in the process of putting that uh the Corvette back to stock I mean I think it's still only got like six thousand miles on it but he still owns it to this day <clears throat> still owns it to this day what a beautiful car wow but yeah some of the some of the stories from back in the Street racing when you could get away with that stuff and 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 uh, had, had a lot of fun. It sounds like your your dad does he he's still tinkering and he's still working or no no he's uh, retired he had some some heart issues and stuff a few years ago and and you know he's almost eighty now so okay. he's uh, taking care of grandkids and um, <clears throat> we moved him down good God I don't know a bunch of years ago when 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 I started having kids and um, racing and my mom and dad they wanted to get out of the Berlin uh, Plainville area and, and um, move uh, move south but the weather was a little better for them and and we had I had three kids me and Nan so it was great to have my 
parents a couple miles up the street from us to help take kids and for as much traveling as we were doing and, and, and be part of their life. So it's a lot of fun. And then Scotty, you know, moved down and, and he's two miles from me and right. a mile from my parents. So it's nice that we're all really close. Yeah. I, I run into Scott every once in a while at Millbridge because you know, yeah. his boy races. Did you go out there at all or to Mountain Creek Speedway? I, I, I have not. Not I, once or twice, but it's been so long. I just, man, nights are so hard. My, my kids are uh, uh, in sports or have been. I get two in college now. And my my uh, youngest is is playing high school football. So if I have any time to do anything, it's 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 um you know sticking ball stuff. Yeah, for him. Okay, and, and, I got you. I got you. Millbridge is cool though, because no matter what, you always uh bump bump into someone you know. <laughs> for sure. You know for for sure. But it's cool seeing Scott when he runs out there with his his little guy, and they've won too. Uh, yep. So that's and that's pretty hard to do out there because. The, I don't know if you've seen it, but the competition, competition. is, it's as tough as any weekly racing anywhere. It's, it's wild. But, uh, but for you, what was your, uh, what was your weekly track going, growing up? Because for me, it was Islip. It was Islip Speedway. We would sit in the grandstands with the Dillner family and that's kind of how, how we all got to know each other. But, uh, what was your weekly track I, going I, up? I mean, I was, I grew up in, in, in Berlin, New Britain, Connecticut. So it was, it was, um, Stafford in Thompson and we did some Riverside stuff, you know, all, all the big races we did and then w would go up there, but it was usually Stafford and Thompson where the, uh, with the big weekly stuff when, when, um, I started working, you know, and that was when Brett, but I started driving and, and, um, I started traveling with those, with those guys at like 14 and, um, learning and, and, you know, I was fortunate that I got to surround myself with some, some really good people that, 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 you know, if you had a little bit ambition and you wanted to learn and, you know, mountain tires and cleaning up and the next thing you know, you're building stuff, you're painting stuff. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it was old school. It was, it was a lot of fun. I really miss, miss those days and the hands-on stuff. So at 14, were you able to get into the pits? Or oh, yeah. They, 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 they would yeah. sneak in? Or yeah, they... <laughs> all the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, put you in the back of the, <laughs> the, back of the truck or yeah. something like that. Oh, yeah, they, they used to do that with me too. Uh, but, yeah, you know, growing up, that that uh, that Sherry Cup number 12 car, man, that thing just stood out. I mean, I my early memories of it are watching Brett Bodine in it, uh, you know, running. And then they went to an even brighter uh, colors of it um, when Mike McLaughlin started yep. driving it. Now, when Mike won his two championships on the tour, you were only crew chief for one year, right? Not both? We won one, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and Clyde then, um, was the crew chief for the other one? We won, yeah. And then... Um, I think that was right when Clyde was getting ready to move to move south, and then we were kind of in that transition where we were uh, Mike Greechy, um started doing some Bush North stuff. Mm -hmm. So then we went to splitting the, the 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 schedule, and I would stay and work on the modified. Mike was up on the Bush North, and then would go up and travel and crew chief the Bush North car and the and the modified because we were doing part season, and then we went full time um, with the, with the Bush North stuff and, and Mike Greechy. So. Um, it was fun because we had a lot, of, like I said, you had Clyde. My uncle Billy obviously is, is instrumental to, to where I am today and every little bit of success and um, well, giving I mean, me that opportunity. I lived with him for years in, in, in Berlin and in uh, New Britain when I, I, I um, wasn't even out of high school yet, and I would stay there with him and, and go to school and come back and go work on the modified every night. And Did you um, work in the cup shop? Le the you know the sherry cup shop yeah right? yeah okay. the chicken coop okay oh yeah for years yeah chicken yeah coop? it was an old chicken coop yeah i can really? convert, convert it over my uncle paul had some sports cars that he raced lime rock and some of those things on, on one side of it and the other side was a um was where we had the, the two or three modifieds were were were, were sitting in there so yeah uh, that was the other thing that i also found out like uh, your family is huge into road racing like your uncle did the uh, what the uh, imsa camel gtp yep. series um formula atlantic uh like all of that that higher upper level road course stuff yeah he was doing doing that and and we were racing you know uncle billy was racing the modifieds uncle paul and um was 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 doing the road course stuff and and uh, sports car stuff did you ever go over and turn wrenches on the sports car side? Or Not really. We had so much work on on, on our side all the time, and, um, and I really enjoyed uh, learning the, the the modified stuff and learning to fabricate and part of it, and and you know then setups and all of that that, that stuff that kind of comes along with it. So mm -hmm. I really concentrated on that side. And that was all at an early age too, because from what I had looked up, you had won your first championship uh, on the tour at 21 years old. 
you were tw- when you won yeah, your first championship. Yeah, and then um, I don't remember '97 was my first was my Bush North championship, and then I moved moved uh, south. Well, actually, I moved. Clyde Clyde got me down here in '92 and '93 with Todd Bodine, and I was working on the car and changing tires and pit stops, and um, I had an opportunity. I still had a house up north, and you know, financial means and stuff at that time, and I I, I was I was enjoying it. Um, but I had opportunity to go back and felt like I kind of had a little unfinished business up north and, and really wanted to uh, try to win some more races in a championship and had an opportunity to, to, to go back up there and then uh, had the opportunity to work with Mike Stefanik and win the Bush North Championship. And at that point, then I had a I had a ton of great opportunities to uh, to move back down to Charlotte. Okay. Uh, when you were back up north, at what point were you looking at the Bush North Series thinking – okay i'm gonna try crew chiefing full body cars uh, and because you know at the northeast is modified country up that way and everybody wants to run a modified but uh at what point did you start looking at the full fender cars thinking you know this is something for me to do well like i said in in, in uh 89 90 we mike Grichi had bought a couple of cars we bought a car from uh from morosos from robbie morosos and we went to daytona we ran tried to run charlotte we had run some stuff. So we were doing, at that point, we were running, I think we ran 12 or 13 modified races, the big ones, and then we were starting to dabble in the in the, in the Bush North and a few Bush South races. Um, and then, you know, Oxford, uh, the big Oxford races, the Loudoun races, you know, 1990, we went and um, with Mikey and we were, uh, did the first first car on the racetrack, we did a tire, Goodyear tire test, and then went back for that double header, and 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 I won, you know, won both of them as a crew chief that day with the modified in the Bush North. So that was a, that was a big day being home. Um, that was and that, that was a special place. Yeah, they paid good money back then for 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 that. It was a big race for us. Um, and that so, race really also <clears throat> put Mike on the map, or put him in absolutely. the eyes of you know the other NASCAR team owners to to hire him. Um, that was the other thing too. You had the Coors Extra Gold. Modified, yep. which was gorgeous, one of the most the prettiest cars too. Um, and right before we and we got sh- free bear back then. That was a big deal, you know. Really, you weren't making any money, right? So, he's- <laughs> <laughs> so they would send you just cases oh, of beer. Yeah, lots of beer. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, well, you didn't have to worry about buying, <laughs> you know, your beer tab. But uh, those two cars, man. I mean, that was that was such a cool deal with uh, the the modified on one side and and the, the Bush North car on the other side. Um, when, when did Mike Stefanik come into the fray? Was that after McLaughlin went south? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, there was a- Andy Santier drove a little bit. We had um, Jerry Marquis drove a full season. So okay. that was 92, nine, yeah, 91, 93, 94, 95 um, in, in, that, in that era. And, Both um, solid drivers, too. Yep. I mean, yep. God, a lot of fun. Legends in their own right. Absolutely. You know, that's the one of the, the things, too, that we try to do with this show is, like, you may not have made it to the Cup Series or to IndyCar, but, you know, the guy sitting in the seat is a legend, and, you know, we got to we gotta treat him that way. There was a lot back then. There were some great racers up there. Mm-hmm. God, I miss those days of, of just when you showed up, you know, the when the, the Bush North stuff, uh, the Dave Dion's and the Dragons and the, you know, I mean, them guys were just, they were just racers. You know, yeah, and um, what what I loved about it, too, is they were real guys. Absolutely. You know, like they worked, you know, Monday through Friday jobs and, and things like that. Uh, a lot of the things that we don't see much of uh, anymore. And uh, we're going to bounce around, too, because now I'm, yeah. my head's going, <laughs> my head's going, the ADD's kicking in. So now my head's going a bunch of different directions because, yeah, the racing the way it is now is, is different back then. Um, the... Uh, and I asked this to Bill Venturini when he was in here, and I'll ask you too, can a guy get a ride on their ability anymore? Because, uh, you know, money, of course money helps. And look, I get it. These are businesses. They've got to stay open. They've got to keep the lights on and the employees paid. But, you know, can a guy get a ride on their talent? It's pretty hard today. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I guess it depends on what level you're at and, and, and where you're at, you know, the, the OEMs seem to, you know, some of them are, are pretty aggressive with some of the younger guys and helping them kind of progress through and trying to tie them up at the, the 14, 15, 16 year, you know, age group. Um, and just seeing how they do in the, in the, in the ARCA stuff now, and then the, you know, some trucks. And so obviously with, with the manufacturers helping, it seems like it's kind of moved that way a little bit. If you're, if you're a 
a young superstar mm-hmm. of them trying to, to tie you up and then that way they can move you up in the in the pipeline um but the money's got to come from somewhere right? and some of it's you know like i said the oems do, do a good job but some of them are, are really helping that or mm-hmm. you know um having sponsors and, and and people that they have relationships with that, that they can bring in but mm-hmm. it's pretty hard it's gotten it's gotten expensive um and in, in, in all forms of racing you know and and um so i, I that's a Unfortunately, it's harder, a lot harder today than it than it than it once was. Um, right. I understand. Are you guys looking at any short track kids now that are like on the radar, saying, "Hmm, he's you know he's a possibility" or something like that? Uh, I mean, they're getting because they're getting all, younger and younger. I know I mean, it's crazy, they, right? I mean, they, they've got the kid that's running the Smart Modified Tour, won four races or five races this year. He's fifteen years old. I mean, it's just it's pretty awesome to see the young guys having ha- having success. And it is, but it's it's it. Th- hopefully, they get the opportunity to to to, to develop and mature. Um, they're getting you know so young that they're that they're they haven't experienced life. They haven't they haven't just simply matured and understand you know the other part of it they drive a car um and they do a really good job at it so hopefully you know the the, the good young talented ones they take their time they move them up and they, they they let them experience um both sides of life a little bit right i think i still think that's that's important for people you can't go back and and, and get the your younger age right there's a lot of things that we all probably look like we think we go back and like what i do it different just to experience oh, yeah. things, mm-hmm. you know, to, to, you know, life in the, in the motorsports world is, 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 seems like it's a whirlwind. You don't have a lot of time to sit back and think about what you did, how you did. It's just what's next. You know, it's always what's next. And, and, um, so sometimes you miss, you know, you may have a, a great career. You may have done a lot, but you, you, you miss a lot in life also when you're doing it. Yeah. Well, that's what we were saying before the show started. 37 years you've been on the road now. That's, Man, that is it's a lot of weekends. That's, that's yeah, yeah um, for almost four full decades. I mean, I did twenty years, so I even after twenty <laughs> years, I was like, man, another plane, <laughs> uh, you know, another canceled flight, another delay. It, it's it's um, it's almost like a, I don't know if I'm gonna say a, a, a habit, but it's just like you know, by my Thursday, I'm my bag's packed and I'm 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 ready. It's it's just a become such a routine and you have a weekend off and and which aren't very few of them mm-hmm. um we don't have very many of those so uh you're almost lost you know what i mean and then when i'm not racing as soon as i'm done i get home from phoenix um i always leave that thursday or friday and i'm off for i don't know six to ten days on a, on a, on a hunting trip that i've kind of had planned and that that's like my golf game that's my 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 right. time is to just sit out in the woods and 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 um uh, you know hunt some deer spend some time thinking and processing things and and uh you know i just really enjoy that it's got to be a huge difference between the loud tense screaming <laughs> engines and then the silence of the woods yeah and at that point in time of the year i need it yeah so it's a, <laughs> it's a good recharge it's a good you know kind of let me get get myself my thoughts back in and and uh, you know what we need to work on what i need to work on uh where i am as a person and and you know um, just, and, and just truly just enjoying the outdoors. I mean, it's, it's, it's just some therapy? beautiful, yeah, absolutely. There's just some beautiful places in the, in, in this country to, to go out and sit and just, you know, just okay. take in. It's like a, we got a place in Nebraska. I have a, a lease, a house out there that I own in a, um, 65,000 acre continuous lease. And it doesn't matter where you are on the hills, you look, it is a, it is an absolute beautiful picture. So if you see something or you don't, you can sit up on there all day long and just look around in the wildlife. It's just, I don't know, to me that's beautiful. It's very it's very calming and, and you know, kind of lets your mind wander and recharge your batteries and, and, and you know, so but like I said, by the, by the end of the year I'm ready for, for a little bit of time. That's cool. No, I can, I can understand that because I've traveled all over and, yeah, just going to different places like uh, been to Colorado, just driving through there. It's you beautiful. stop on the side of the road, everything looks like a postcard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. All right, now the hunting stuff. Okay, you're going to have to educate me on this because <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about hunting. Uh, I'm an indoor cat, so you know, you're going to have to you know, tell me all about how the hunting started and, and what goes into it and what do you do? You, do you hunt with a bow, with a gun? What do you, what do, you do? Yeah, I, I like uh, both archery and, 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 and a rifle. Um, so when I was, was young, we lived, I lived in Berlin until uh, about 10 years old. 
and then my parents moved out to East Haddam, which is about 45, 50 minutes or so from, from the Berlin area. Bought a house with some some land, and my mom wanted to get into some horses, and, and my, my sister rode horses and um, gave me and, and, and my brother, Scott, an opportunity to get into the outdoors a little more. And, uh, you know, snowmobiles, dirt bikes, and we lived on a – it wasn't far from the Colche- Colchester drag strip at that time. So we could leave the backyard. Me and Scotty, we, we could ride our dirt bikes. There was a, a hunting lo- a camp. It was like 25, 30,000 acres of all these 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 rich doctors that paid this ridiculous amount of money um, to go fishing. And we would ride and sneak through there, and we would ride our snowmobiles and our, and our dirt bikes, and we'd run right up to the Colchester drag strip during the week, and we'd – race down the drag strip and they'd come chase you out and <laughs> we'd go back home and then snowmobiles we'd, we would ride out there so that was the beginning of, of of the outdoor stuff as a young kid in berlin it was i mean you rode your bike around and and, and it was pretty city you know like so um and my dad hunted a little bit my grandfather that owned cherry cup um had a place in vermont so we spent a lot of time up there as kids in the in the, in the off season and in the summer we would go up honestly sometimes a month two months and stay with my grandparents and my mom and my dad would would, would come back and forth on weekends and um enjoy the place a beautiful place up on on, on the mountain and my grandfather would um, for deer season like two weeks would bring a lot of the customers and stuff in and they would deer camp and so my dad spent time up there with 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 my uh, my grandfather and so i got into hunting a little bit when and um when i was in uh east Haddam, i spent some time hunting and learning and fishing and stuff. So I kind of 10, 12 years old kind of started getting into that. And then as I got a little older, I got back into the, you know, the racing. I, I really wanted to get back. And then, and then, um, as soon as I, I, I could, I, I did every trip I could. And then as soon as I got my, my driver's license and I got a car, that's when I moved in, you know, basically with my uncle Billy and lived in Berlin. And I drive to, to school and then I'd come back and stay with him and work on the car. And, and so, I got away from it for a little while, and um, when I moved down here, I was like, man, I, I, a lot of my guys that, that worked with me liked to fish, and um, Tony liked to fish and hunt when we when we got going. So we would we would fish because we were on the road. You could, you know, on a Saturday afternoon or something after practice, we there was a lot of little good places you could find on the road. So I just kind of slowly got back into it and, and um, met, met Hal Schaefer, who, who worked for me for 15 years now and helped me start the, sh- the, the show um said hey i got a, a why don't you come hunting with me a mutual friend an engineer at, 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 that has passed jim strasser knew him um and i uh, worked at, at gibbs and he says uh we're doing a tv show why don't you come be a guest on it and went and did it it was fun just felt it was all about the fellowship that that's what i enjoy a lot about hunting is is I got to spend a lot of time with my brother and some of my good friends that, that that I did race with. We would, you know, we'd all pack up and go to Canada for ten days and hang out and tell stories, drink some whiskey, you know what I mean, and <laughs> and, and, and try to shoot a, you know, if, if it if a dare come out, it was, but it was a, it was more the fellowship and the you know the ball breaking and uh, and all the, all all the good stuff that went. So I kind yeah. of just really in, in, enjoyed that, and it's it's kind of really just stuck with me. Clyde told me to ask <laughs> you about the hunting lodge stories. He said you got a <clears throat> you got a couple of hunting lodge stories that are that are pretty funny, but uh, he said he'll let you he'll let you tell them. So if you th- if you think of them at all during the show, yeah. But uh, oh, you got one? <laughs> well, I, I do. Just there's there's lots of them. We we I mean, from just some of the weather that, that we, we we went to Canada one time, and um, I think there was like six or seven of us in this cabin that um, only had a wood stove, and it was a it was a an old wood stove, so it didn't have the blower and the insulation and the you know that that runs all night. And um, it was we were there seven or eight days, and the warmest it was was 19 below zero. It was 28 below zero for a good bit of the time. Like, we would fill your car up. We had a Suburban I rented, and we'd fill it up with gas, and you'd leave it running all night, and you'd put, we'd go get charcoals, and you'd, you'd start a fire, and you'd back the car up over it so that the it would stay running and it would be warm in the morning um, so that you could get it or it wouldn't start, you know. Um, you had, and, wait a minute, you had to light a fire yeah. and back the car over it? Just the cold. Under the, what, yeah, under, yeah. under the, the yeah, oil pan? Yeah, yeah, so the, the heat from that would, 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 would keep it, and you could you could get it you get it running in the morning. Yeah, because the oil is um, probably like molasses, yeah. right? and we were, you know, we were in this little old cabin. I mean, like, the the mattresses were on the floor. The, the 
you could see the chanking was all missing out of some of the log cabins, all frosting through there. And, and I finally moved out on the couch because after the first night, the fire kept going out. So you just get up every two hours and, and stoke the fire and, and to get through the water, be frozen in the morning. But, it, but it, I mean, you just remember those things. It was and just that's fun. Good. Like, yeah, oh it was God. just, well, when you're all there, you, know, you get home at night and the bear's frozen because the place froze. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't drink because all, all the no, stuff's we, frozen. No, we, we learned after the first night, we stopped and got fresh stuff and brought it back in with us uh, every night. Okay. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> God, because I'm well. First off, I'm 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 skinny as hell, so cold goes right through me. I can't stand the cold. But uh, God, 19 below. Oh God, you must have been layered up the whole time. Yeah, you could only sit a couple hours at a time, you know. So you'd, you'd pick the you know morning and you'd ride a lot and try to do some spotting and stalking and, and stuff. But yeah, it, it was cold, but it was crazy cold. But but it was um you know it was one of those, those trips that you'll never forget. It was it was fun. The fellowship and the Mm-hmm. You know, taking shifts, of, you know, just it was it was almost like in survival. You know what I mean? Um, and that, and cool. that's that you like that kind of stuff, the 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 camping I'm, and the the survival I'm, kind of stuff. I, I mean, yes, but <laughs> you know, there's there's you know, there's rough in it, and then there's you know what I mean. There there's um, I do like going to some really nice. There's some really really nice hunting lodges and places out there in in, in the world that you you experience the 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 outdoors and the hunting and then you when you come in at night you know it's it's like a five star um, place so I like to mix it up a little bit and like to go to some of those because those are really relaxing mm-hmm. and then I love the 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 roughing it I just don't want to rough it all the time you know what I mean I got okay. I got to get a little bit of a mixture of it you know what I mean okay. Um, so. so okay so let's let's play MythBusters <clears throat> here a little bit uh, do 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 hunters really spray deer piss on themselves when they go hunting is, is that true no you you they there there is there is the the deer piss or the you know the estrogen that you get and you you'll dip it or you'll make a drag and you'll run it in as a as a or you'll spray it in the area to cover your scent or to attract a buck but i have never put it on myself and oh, don't okay. ever intend to put it on myself <laughs> okay. now maybe that's why i'm not as good as some of these other hunters i haven't tried that but, but they i'll, do, I'll, will but they I'll do pass that? I, I don't i don't honestly i don't know anybody that's ever Put that on themselves. Really? You, you use it as an attractant mm-hmm. or a cover scent of your of, of yourself, and and that, and that's during the rut. You know, when the, when the, when the doe are in, in heat, that that two to three weeks a year type of a, a situation. You know what I mean? It gets the, the the buck up sniffing around a little bit more than than, um, and it, you know your 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 scent, my scent. You know, everything is, is different. So when it, when you're out there, it's different to them. So when they smell something that they're not used to. They tend to be a little bit more leery or, 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 you know, stay away from it. So if you can do anything to help yourself covering the scent, um, that's where a lot of that stuff kind of come from over the years. You have to also, like, wash your, your clothes in certain detergents or, and stuff like that, right? So <clears throat> a, lot of the new, the, a lot of the new clothing has, a, has all kinds of different things in it that help um, contain your, your body odor, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yes, there's, there's uh, deodorant. There's shampoo there's there's stuff to wash your clothes with that, that have no scent there's tooth toothpaste and things of that nature so if you you know it depends on how 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 crazy you get but yeah. um depends on where you're at but it it, it it honestly it if you do it all it works if you skip one part of it it doesn't really matter then right because okay you're either all in or not you know what i mean but <laughs> but the, the wind you know and all honestly if you play the wind right which sometimes is really hard because uh, um you know just depending on where your stand is and situation um, that day, but you know, the wind is your best friend. If you can get it, you know, getting your, 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 uh, odor blowing away from you, right. Then, then the deer behind you. But if you, if you know where they're coming and you know, their transitions and their things of that nature, you, you, you play the wind most evenings. So like you have to <clears throat> know their movements and how they, like how you track them, I guess. Is that <clears throat> how you do it my wife first off is going to have a heart attack and we, she hears us talking about this because she's an animal lover and we have a family of deer that walks through our yard almost nightly because <clears throat> they they pick out of the the, oh, yeah. the bird feeders they eat out of, so my wife is an animal lover so when she hears us talking about shooting deer she's gonna, <laughs> she's gonna have a heart attack and, and, and i am i am too we have them in our, in our, in our you know my place in, in, in mooresville or in our yard and and stuff but you know when you when you go out to these these where where I'm going is, is you're on sixty five thousand acres and you're trying to find one mature 
five and a half, six and a half, seven year old deer to, to harvest, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a sport. I don't, I don't personally go out and just shoot something to shoot it. Mm-hmm. Um, I shoot something that I'm going to hang on the wall and we eat about everything that, that, that we do shoot or harvest, you know? So, um, mm-hmm. we, we try to make the most of it. Um, mm-hmm. grew up on it. My, my wife did, her dad was a big hunter. Um, so she, she likes venison. My kids grew up on it. So, okay. I mean, it's, it's, a it's good if it's cooked right. It's there's nothing better. No, I know I've had it before. It is it is very good, and uh, the show too is is a huge hit on the Outdoor Channel. You guys have been around for what, like fifteen, 15 years. Fifteen yeah. years. Yeah, it's been doing. It's been it's been going well. Um, it's fun. Uh, like I said, it gives me an opportunity to to get off a little bit. And and I I started it. Um, my youngest son liked fishing. Zach, or my oldest. I'm sorry. And and. I missed a lot of his time growing up because that's when we were, you know, um, traveling with the 20 car and, mm-hmm. um, he started showing some interest and I'm like, well, maybe I'll start this and it'll give me some opportunity to, to get some time back with, with, with my kids and my family. And, and we do a family show every year where all of us go. And, and, um, now my son, Zach has, is taking a small part in the show and, and, and helping with it and, uh, loves to hunt and fish 24 seven. My daughter's always on me now, Ellie. She shot a deer a couple years ago, <laughs> and she's like, "Padre, where, where, when are we going? When is my weekend to go hunting with you?" Right? So she loves it. So that I mean, when 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 that stuff starts happening, yeah, I mean, it's just re- rewarding that they want to go spend some time and 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 sit out in a tree or ride around in the Polaris and you know what I mean, spend time. some time. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. great time. No, I I get it, <clears throat> and and, and uh, you know, everyone has their own ways of doing it, and, and it's really amazing how you know the parallel because you know you grew up with the racing you also grew up with the hunting and you're kind of becoming a success at at both of them uh so uh um are they is is one more rewarding than the other or is it is it an equal feeling i think i mean obviously the racing you know that was all i've ever wanted to do as a kid um uh worked day night weekends i mean just whatever it took um and, and and just wanted to keep keep climbing and, 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 and getting to where I got, which I never thought that that was possible and, and, and uh, was pretty blessed to, to have great opportunities and, and make the best of them, surround yourself with good people and, and uh, you know, things have been, been really good. The hunting thing I really like now from the rewarding part of that my family and my kids want to go and be, 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 you know, the, the, when I started it, it was uh, more of just a getaway and a, uh, my golf game or my, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so but now that you know the kids want to go with you and spend time with you, um, it, that that's it, and it's gotten to the point where when they they harvest a deer, before I do, or it's 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 more rewarding and, and, and fun that you you spent that time and you're making those memories. Do they bust dad's chops too because they got one and you didn't? Oh, uh, they're 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 pretty good at that. <laughs> Even my daughter, yeah. Uh, well, you you also said your son works on the show as, as well. Is he doing like telev- the production side of it, like running a camera or editing? He's uh he's um just finishing college. He's at the University of Tampa, so he he graduates this December. So he came back and did an internship um a little bit this summer, and um he's doing the um just kind of started with the store and the. Uh, Shopify and the website and kind of he's kind of taking he's a little bit uh he's good that way okay the multimedia yeah yeah he cool. loves the he's dabbled a little bit and takes some some video courses and he can put clips together and so he's he's learning that but he you know he he loves to hunt on top of it so that's the stuff that I don't really want to do mm-hmm. and it's given him an opportunity to get involved in the show and and you know take a little bit of ownership in it and, and um so he's doing pretty good at it it's all turning into social content now. <laughs> Everything. This show, uh, you know, really, I, we have built a, an audience via social media. I mean, when you started following us, I looked at him like Greg Zip, and I'm like, no way. <laughs> and then I saw the blue check. I'm like, this really is following our show? And I was just like, holy shit. And yeah, so it's it's all with platforms now. Uh, you know, um, Rick Benjamin was on the show and he said, you know, the influencer can have a, m- a million followers. Well, there are TV shows that don't have a million viewers. Right. So, yeah, uh, and now it's all about content, you know, the all the way. Well, uh, everybody's got a phone, right? And right. not everybody wants, I mean, it seems like, you know, from a TV perspective, not to digress, but everything is streaming now and now you gotta have three or four platforms to get everything, but you can, my, my my kids will sit on the couch, they'll watch TV shows, 
off their phone and i'm like that drives me crazy i gotta <gasps> see it on the, on the big screen <laughs> right? but but that that the you know what i mean that the, that age group is so they 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 can get more on their phone than I can get on my TV. I know, and I keep hearing more and more. I learned it on TikTok. I learned <laughs> yeah. it. You know, my wife, oh, she is addicted to TikTok too. It's just, and yeah, it's just like change the channel, change the channel, swipe, 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 and that's the way it's going to now. It is. I didn't want to have to make a, a TikTok for for this show, but we did because just it's just another platform yeah. I got to entertain when we do a post. I, I get it. Um, okay, changing gears, ADD kicking in again. Um, did I hear a story that you almost became Dale Earnhardt's crew chief? No, I don't know. I had opportunity to work with Jeff Gordon and, you know, and, and some others, um, in the, in, in the sport. Um, well, wasn't this, I talked well, to them, but I didn't, uh, I had opportunity to go to DEI. Um, so, um, I wasn't, I was pretty committed to where I was with, with, at Joe Gibbs Racing at the time, but I had a, I had a lot of, a lot of really good and cool opportunities. Uh, well, this was before you got, came to the sport, I, I should say. I had heard that you were interviewing and uh, you were a huge Dale Earnhardt fan. I was, he was the man. I mean, if you were just went to, I just love going to Rockingham and we come down and race or just come down for the weekend and watch him at some of these places. I mean, there's a lot of really talented guys, but I mean, that man could just elbow up and get her done yeah i mean it was it was it was a lot of fun to watch um racing back then and and i mean it's great today but it just was so different back then when you look at those cars and you the ingenuity and and how they got from there to where they are today and 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 all the little tricks and the first one that could you know you could just work on your stuff and find some little things that really moved the needle then right that were a lot of fun you know what i mean from suspension stuff from the aero stuff from the you know and it didn't it didn't it didn't take a lot. Now our cars are so so close. It's and, and your hands are tied. It's 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 different. Uh, you know, I would I'm I guess a little bit more from the old school. I grew up building our own chassis and the modifieds and the body panels and the interiors and all the. You know what I mean? Mikey was a big part of of, of a lot of the ingenuity and the modifieds growing and the the no shapes and the interior stuff that we used to do back then in those cars and. Um, and that was fun when you could you could just sit there and look at something and you pull the strings out and you you set all this stuff up and you get door tops and how am I going to get the interior and how am I going to do all that stuff now you you buy a body panel and you put it on I mean the racing's still great it's, it's still competitiveness it's just it's just different it's well it's also the ability of wanting to be creative because you know uh, growing up I mean I came from a little bit of the end of that era where guys built their own cars to to go race so when you heard of someone building a new car for next year you kind of got like a little excited because you knew they were a good something car was different right yeah. you knew they were a good car builder or something like uh, what was the year the year mike stefana came out with that pink and purple car mm -hmm. for the big tracks and it was all enclosed in the bodywork mm -hmm. and everything i mean just like all of that stuff uh that's why I love super modified racing because super modified Those things are sick. <laughs> right? They are sick. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. <laughs> super modified racing it's like okay uh build the fastest thing you can think about uh, the fastest thing you can think of. The and, uh, race it. So I, I mean obviously when we grew up up north racing the, the, the modifieds they were you know when you went to Oswego that place was just crazy and they were super fast but when you could go to Thompson or you could go to Star you know because we would race the Bush North cars and they would be there a lot. Good God, and you see Bentley Warren and some of them guys all that thing down in there and see that wing, yeah. you know, it was just... Dave Samar, Dick very, Batchelder, very cool. all those guys, yeah, just and the way that the wing moved. And then when you go see him at Thompson, they're so freaking fast, fast down the straightaway, insane. you see the, the contrail coming off the damn wing. It's yeah. just... Awesome. It is just wild, I know. I've, uh, I've reported the Oswego <laughs> Classic a couple of times, and... Uh, the I don't know if you know it, but like the Oswego uh, Supers are different from the Isma Supers in the sense that the Oswego Supers are more like Indy cars. Like they've got four fuel tanks in the car. They've got one up in the nose and on the side and under the guy's leg. So all through the race, they're switching. They're moving it around. Yeah. They're switching. Their, yeah, they get the balance of the car right. I mean, it is. It's a science. It, it, it's wild. That's one of the things that I love about super modified racing. Midget racing was like that too because guys would be building wild and radical midgets. Um, what were some of the things that uh, you enjoyed building or putting together that were innovative at the time that uh, were 
I would say cheating, but now you can talk about it. The statute of limitations has run out. <laughs> yeah, I think it just depends on the error. But I mean, honestly, when I started in the the, the modifieds, like I said we started down dabbling, and then when we got in the, the the Bush North stuff. You could, you could, you could manipulate some templates and some things. You know, um, you know your your roof and your deck lid location, your quarter heights and the offsets and stuff. And then they they would slowly catch on to it. Um, I remember one. Um, we were at. Uh, I built a new car and we took it to Pocono and um, we were like first or second point. So it was right out behind the NASCAR trailer. And um, I got called to the trailer and um, <laughs> this was a Bush North race. No, this was the uh, cup racing and, and oh, got, at Nazareth. No, this was at, at Pocono. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and so it was parked out and the NASCAR trailer was here. So you look right out the back and, and I got called to the trailer and um, I had never <laughs> got my butt chewed for something that I actually I did that was innovative that um, there really wasn't a rule on. But it was that's when some of the F3 templates and, and, and the claw and the grid started coming out and stuff like that. But it was it was it was pretty funny. Tony has one of those cars um, at his place up there and everybody goes up and looks at it and the, the, the fenders and the quarter panels and the roof is down. I don't know, I can't say how far down, right? <laughs> so we this was, it was yeah. one of the 20 cars. And it, yes, one of the 20 cars. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't too much longer. They, they, uh, they took my car at Texas. Oh no. It was the first one that I think that they, <laughs> that they had ever taken and confiscated going through tech. And we had to unload the backup car and get it ready for the race. Tony with some of that pissed. stuff. Yeah. Well, he, yeah, he, he was, he loved that stuff as long as you were working on them. It didn't, you know what I mean? Right. You're trying to make them better, and and you know everybody. That was the game for everybody back back in the day. But that was, that's when it was fun when you just sit and think about things, and you could look at things, and you could almost visualize um, stuff because you could move stuff so much. Mm -hmm. um, at, 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 in those days, I mean, it was nothing to move a tail over four inches. You know <laughs> what I mean? Off the center line, and you know what I mean. And, um, Stuff like that, you know, roofs down, deck lids, all, all, all stuff that, you know, just, you know, literally making down fours in, in, right. um, in, the, in those days. But um, those days are over. <laughs> no, I, I, I remember because, um, you know, a lot of those guys were buying uh, or manipulating the steel body cars in NASCAR Kane and Pro Series when it was, it moved over to, um, from Bush North and it became K&N. And I remember Brian Eichler showed up at Greenville Pickens with a car that was just all jacked up and had huge rake in it and everything, and it was, it was wild looking. But uh, and that's actually where I first started really chatting and talking with Mike Ricci uh, more. And we got to get Ricci on, on here. He's a good oh dude, man. God, God he's a, we had some fun days with him. So you, you know what? Uh, we were talking with Clyde wants to do an episode in the bar. Is, uh, next I like door. that one. Yeah, I like, like that idea. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> yeah. all right. we got to add I'm you. In. Yep. We got to add you to the list too. That you're in on that. Absolutely. One? Okay, cool. Because yeah, Bodine wants to come do it in the bar. Oh, yeah. Todd does. Uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Clyde does. You do. Todd. Brett. Brett yeah. does. Mike McLaughlin. We already talked to Mike about coming and doing yeah. a bar episode. So we're gonna we're gonna have to get some more mics. I guess. Yes. <laughs> but um, we Greechy days. We would. Uh, we were. We were. He had uh, the florist in Granby, and um, uh. Me and Mike worked full time on the on the Bush North car there, and I mean, uh, it, it was just them them days. That guy, he he gets so mad at us. Mikey would egg him on and just <laughs> absolutely torment him beyond. Like he would, it, it literally. I can't tell you how many times he would come in and pull the garage doors down and said, "You both are fired. Get the f out of here." He says, "We're done. We're not racing this week." I'm, you, you know what I mean? I mean, like he go over, open the garage, open the garage door. We're back open for business. He come back, close the dang, dang door. I want. You know. How many times did Greechy quit Bush North Racing? I I don't know that. I don't even know what the number is. It is so high, <laughs> it's not even funny. <laughs> but what I will say about him was he, he, he blew off his steam and he'd come right back in there. He'd be back in there that night working side by side with you and getting get, getting us all the tools and the things that, that the parts and pieces that that we needed, you know. But, I mean, it was stressful. I mean, the guy was, you know, spending his money trying to find sponsorship and, you know, me and Mikey are, 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 are working, you know, yeah, making I, a making a living off of uh, off of it and, and racing, but God, we had some fun. He's a he's a great guy, um, Mike. Oh yeah, he's always been super nice to us, to our TV crew. Whenever we went and we had a question, he would you know just explain st uh, stuff to us. And I think he also gave me a little bit of respect because I was a modified guy, yeah. and, and so that kind of helped. But um, 
You know what the funny part is, is that um, uh, you guys went from the Coors Extra Gold sponsorship to Burnham Boilers, right? Yeah, there was wheels that was in there, and it was a like I said, and that at that time there was the, that transition to Coors Extra Gold, and then when when Mikey left, and um, uh, like I said, Jerry Marquis, and then and then um, uh, Andy Sinter was there, and then and you know Mike Stefanik, so there was a he was really at the Burnham Boilers um, at, at that time, but there mm-hmm. was a a lot of a lot of different a lot of different ones back back in the day, you know. Mike Stefanik was just a genius, wasn't he? He's a great guy. Oh my god. Just a down to earth. You know, he you could sit and have conversations with him. He was always thinking, um, fun, fun, fun guy to hang out with. Just great person. But but yeah, it, the ingenuity and the in the in the time and the quality and the uh, you know, his level of detail were, were second to none. Just and and he could drive the hell out oh, of Oh yeah, yeah. That that was yeah, that that was a just a absolute given every time he showed up you knew you were going to race him you know what i mean that was a but you just didn't know what he was going to bring and what he was thinking about and 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 where he was so but you know people like that they they, they kept everybody kind of um just moving and, and progressing right um when you did that we had to do something and then you know the next one had to do something and then it was like he showed up with a new hutter hutter motor and we're like Uncle Billy, we need a new Hutter motor because he just got one, and I know that one's better than ours. You know what I mean? So it was like that. That always that that keep going. You know what That's I mean? That's what I was going to ask you. How did Mike make you better? I mean, because you know you were competing with him at one point, and then now he's driving for the team. So were there things that you learned from him? Or oh he God, you learned. You? Yeah, like I said, his 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 um, just l- level of detail and his thought process on things, and and you know everybody thinks things a little different and processes things and. Um, I loved working with him because he would share his thoughts, but then he would never, never really second guess you or, you know, when you made your decisions and you talk about things and you go to the racetrack and he would, he'd drive his guts out with whatever you brought. And if it didn't work, we'd come home, we'd sit down and talk and, um, you know, we'd, we'd work on things and, and, and get better. Um, but really enjoyed working, working with him and racing with him. And, and for, for him, it, you know, he didn't really have like an engineering degree or anything like that. It was all just by just trial and error, just learning and yep. doing, right? Self-taught, a lot of it, you know? God, just, you think about where he, I, I mean, I know that, you know, he, the end of his career, he decided, you know, to stay up north and, and do all that, but think to where, you know, the, how different the cup record books may have been had he, you know, gotten some... Gotten the right ride, the right, the, the, the right uh, you know, opportunity, and a lot of that, a lot of it is, is exactly that, right? Getting yourself paired up with the with the right group, with the right person, and, uh, you know, believing in each other and, 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 you know, headed down that road. All right. Now, for you, you never had any desire to drive or, or get behind a wheel? It was all turning I, I wrenches? just loved working on these things. Loved yeah. building them, loved, yeah. I never really, never really, um, I took a modified out with McLaughlin at Thompson and followed him around a little bit, and it was fun, but I I, I just, I, I don't know why. I, I, I snowmobile raced, grass dragged, and ice raced. And off season and stuff, and loved doing that, but never had much of a desire to to, to race a car. I just wanted to to, to, to work on him and, and and be that guy. Now, in what point of your life or your career did you say I want to I want to be a, a a crew chief full time, or I want to I want to move up to the top levels in NASCAR as a crew chief? I mean, I think that was my aspirations and and, and goals as a, as, as a fairly young kid. I mean, when I was working on these modifies, I just wanted to be a crew chief. And then when I, I, I had the opportunity to be the crew chief on the, on the, <clears throat> the number 12, you know, the modified from uncle. And then it was the Bush North stuff, you know, a couple of years later. And then it was, you know what I mean? It just, I, I just was like, what was, you know, what was next? It was like, that was my college, right? It was, okay, I passed this semester. I got to go, what's the next semester? What's the next, you know, next class. So that, that's kind of how I, I grew up old, old school, but it was just kind of the, you know, progressing and accomplishing something. And then, setting your goals and, and, and moving them. So for you coming into the sport, really, uh, you came in as a crew chief, which is very much unheard of lately, uh, actually at all. Like nobody really starts off coming in as a crew chief into the Cup Series, do they? Well, I, I had uh, um, some opportunities. And I, I when I first moved down here after we won our Bush North Championship at Stefanik in 97, I moved down and I went to work at Roush and worked for Jeff Burton. Mm-hmm. And changed. Uh, I was like kind of car chief, changed tires, built built shocks, and set his stuff up that year. Mm-hmm. 
And about halfway, two thirds of that that season, I had an opportunity. I got a call from Jimmy Maycar and a, and a call from um, Joe Gibbs, and, and and went and met them, um, and had that opportunity to uh, start the twenty car from scratch. So that was a pretty exciting. For to your point, for a kid that was down here for a year, that all of a sudden be like, okay, you got to get a trailer, you got to order shocks, you got to order cars, you got to build this and go get your people. And and you know, Jimmy Maycar had a pretty good foundation. He was a great guy. Um, gave me a great opportunity. He's like a, you know, again, another, uh, an older brother. We, we spent a lot, a lot of time together. Really, really respect, um, Jimmy and what he's accomplished and, and, um, was a lot of fun to work with. Very competitive. Yeah. Mad dog. You know, it was so, <laughs> it was fun because I was the same way. I was, a uh, McLaughlin gave me the nickname Snapperhead at a, at a young age, um, <laughs> when things didn't go. <laughs> so, you know, me and Jimmy you were, were, were a little short, hotheads at the, at the time. Uh, yeah, there's, really? there's, yeah, it, there's some stories. It's you know, the out there. In Yeah, it comes it out. Yeah. Oh, and my it's, God. It's, I've learned to control it after 57 years a little better than I did in my 20s and 30s. But um, but it was all in good fun. I mean, it was that was who I was. You know? Okay. No, I, I, I get it. Uh, I've gotten my share of crap over the years for getting too, as they call it, too passionate about, yeah, exactly. about the, the sport. Yeah. Uh, but holy cow, just a year working in it, and then you already elevate to the level of a crew chief. But, you know, it, you were like an upstart crew chief, and then bringing in this upstart driver, you know, in Tony Stewart. And I think you guys just found lightning in a bottle, you know, with, I think that you guys grew together. Because I think if Tony would have been paired up with a veteran crew chief or something, I don't think it would have worked. We both had the same desire and passion to prove to the world that we deserved that opportunity. Um, and and I was a I was a controlling you know my, my group my car my I was and and he was show up and drive. Mm. And when it wasn't right, this is the biggest piece of shit you've ever brought to the racetrack. <laughs> Fix it, and off he would go. You know what I mean? But it, it wasn't like. If I had somebody sitting there telling me all the time, well, this is what's wrong or that's what's wrong. I, like at that time, my personality didn't, didn't like that. I just wanted someone to tell me what is wrong with it. Let me and my people, my guys work on it. You know I mean? I, I, I tell people the stories of, of, we would end up, we would end happy hour. And if I wanted to see him, I needed to go out on pit road where we used to get tire temperatures because as soon as he was done there, he would walk straight to the motor coach, get changed. And he was on a plane, a helicopter, wherever he was to go dirt race. <laughs> And I would not see him or talk to him until the next day at the driver's meeting. And if we weren't very good in practice um, and he was, you know, not happy, he would ask, did you get the Ouija board out last night? Because that's something that needed a lot of changes. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'd go, go through, yeah, we did this. He goes, okay, then we should be okay today. Hey. <laughs> His humor yeah. is just yeah. off the charts. Yeah. Yeah. Just, but yeah. he didn't get, I, I, in, in the, all the years we worked together, I don't, I don't know that he ever one time looked at a setup sheet or asked or one or wanted to even know it was in the car. He said, you just put it in and I'll tell you if it's better or not. Really? And he'd go out and drive it. So, it, so from that perspective, it was a lot of fun because you could, you, you could kind of go about your, 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 you know, your deal. And, and, that. and if, you know, there was days when, when it wasn't working and you were lost that you're like, damn, I wish I could get us a little bit more feedback or I wish you would hang out after practice to have a conversation about what, it, what, what his car was like. Then we got, we made some really big gains with him because we could get him to hang out for about five minutes and give him a track map and he would write tight, loose, tight, loose and draw lines of what the car was. He'd hand it to you and off he went dirt racing. Really? Yeah. No kidding. But Holy you know, God. he was a, he was a racer. He could do, he could do some magical things in a car. Um, he just, <clears throat> no. well, I mean, the, the, the thing is too, is that, uh, I, I grew up on Thursday night thunder on yeah. ESPN. So I knew of Tony long before he made it to IRL actually you know I remember him running sprint cars and midgets and all that so you know to see him you know win at IRL and win in sprint car win in anything he gets his ass into really Absolutely. Uh, it, it really is true when they say he is the AJ Foyt of of this generation um did you know like when you the team was starting did you know of Tony's <laughs> history beforehand I I, I... To, to your point, I, I knew who Tony was. I was a race fan of all series. Mm -hmm. um, I had met um, I met Jimmy Maycar. Um, uh, was when we had the fire in um, they, in Daytona and they canceled the race and we had to go back to Fourth of July. So it was in October. Right, I remember that. 
So we got home that Saturday night, and and, and he called me and told me, you want to meet for breakfast? I got, I just want to pick your brain. And I'm like, okay. And we, we were parked next to each other because I was on the 99, and he was on, you know, crew chief in the 18, and we were like third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and points all year. So we were on either side of each other and just, you know, back then you – you know, it was different. You could hang out. You'd have a beer with somebody afterwards. You, you'd you have conversation. And then when you showed up and it was practice, it would be, you know, put the blinders on and it was all about, uh, you know, your, your deal. So it was it was, it was was good back then, that camaraderie of, of, of the group and the people in the garage uh, um, learning. So you got to meet meet people and, and uh, I got to meet Jimmy and, and talking with him a little bit. And so we, he said, meet me at Cracker Barrel at exit 36 in Mooresville. We'll have breakfast. We sat in those rocking chairs for, I think, about three hours and 45 minutes and never went in to have breakfast. Wow. Um, we just sat and, and talked, and he picked my brain about how I grew up and racing and, you know, learned a little bit about about each other, you know. And um, he just, you know, thanks for your time. And, and that evening, um, Joe Gibbs called me and asked if I could meet him at Denny's at exit 20, uh, 20, <laughs> 28 um, in, in Cornelius. Did you finally have breakfast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I... I uh, <clears throat> Went down there, met him, had an iced tea, and, and talked with him for a little bit. And uh, <clears throat> these are the stories that, that, you know, my wife loves to tell this story. So I was working for um, Jeff Burton and her husband, uh, Frank Stoddard, and Heidi Stoddard. We were we were friends with them. They're mm-hmm. from up north. I raced against Frank. Right. He, the wor- Bush he north worked series. for Stub Fadden, I think. Yep, yeah. yep. So um, Heidi and, and my wife used to hang out all the time. They both were doing PR um in the sport for, for for different teams at that time they were at my house and we were at rockingham testing and um, my phone rang and that was back in the day when you had a phone and you had caller id on it and um nan goes grab that it might be greg we were testing whatever. and she heidi looks at it she goes you might want to get it it says joe gibbs so, my, <laughs> so now heidi's like what is joe gibbs call right because they didn't know i was working for frank and i was testing in rockingham with with jeff burton and anyways my wife answers the phone and and um, it, it was it was coach, and he had called and was looking for me. And she said he was in I was in Rockingham. She gave him my cell phone number. He called me that night, and he offered me the job to start the the, the twenty car. So it was funny how quick it, it 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 happened, and and you know God's faith of of you know putting me with good people and and giving me another great opportunity. Right, right. At, at what point in the early stages or in the first couple of days when you went either testing or to a race where you realized this 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 guy tony stewart's incredible um obviously you know early on it was it was we went to certain places and it was like wow that's crazy you know he pick up and then we went to other places and it was like oh my god um we we had to we had to learn you know i was a short track road racer with the bush north stuff and that was my my forte of building light race cars and 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 understanding that because that's what i grew up doing right and i think that's why Help um, Gibbs and Jimmy was a speedway racer and an intermediate racer, and him and Bobby Labonte showed up at Atlanta and Charlotte, and you were going to race those guys because he had he had really good stuff. I was on the other side of it and really helped advance that program, but then had Jimmy to, to look at and 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 bring in the um, you know the speedway stuff and the intermediate stuff, and and we really you know that year we were able to build some some really good race cars and and, and have a lot of fun. And, and Tony did well at the at the short tracks. Um, and it was the intermediates was um, where we struggled. I had to learn, learn them a little bit, and he had to learn, you know, how, how to drive them. They were a little bit, little bit different. And then, as soon as he figured that out, you know, it wasn't wasn't long. But there was a couple places we went to that could got to Like you'd go every week, and he'd be like, no matter what we did, you know what I mean, and vice versa. He he could change what he did, I could change what I did. Neither one of us could hit our ass, you know what I mean, for a few <laughs> years at a couple of those places. But then we could show up at a, you know, at a Martinsville, or we went to. Mar- <laughs> Martinsville the test and we're like all right we're, we're gonna meet at the shop we're all gonna drive up and we're we we pulled into Martinsville and um he looks at me and he goes uh haha this is really funny and I go what are you talking about he goes this isn't this is a freaking Kmart parking lot we're not testing like he thought we I took him somewhere just to break his shops and I'm like no this is Martinsville we're gonna test here for He'd two never days been and to we're, no and we're gonna and we're gonna race here and he's looking at this place he's like oh my god and we went and we tested for two days our first time there and went and sat on the pole. And um, then we hit every dang thing but the pace car because we were so slow after that that we, <laughs> could, we, could, we couldn't get to it. But but we, we, we figured that place out a little bit over over time. That was another that was another cool place. Because growing up there, going with racing modifieds there. Right. 
you know, and then and then um, in the early days there was some bush races there. So um, I had you know grown and spent spent some time there. Um, Modifieds was obvious that was a that was a huge deal for us to go down and end end our season and you know um, so it was like going to Daytona for 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 the modified guys right especially when the Cup guys were there and oh, it was a big deal right down there were huge <clears throat> and they they today to this day they still are because wish they were you, more you walk yeah you walk through the modified pits at a place like Loudon you know now and you know they're all buzzing about the Cup guys keeping an eye on them so they know they're being watched you know for sure. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the modifieds being what they were. Um, is there anything that you still apply? I mean, obviously, besides, you know, competitiveness, work ethic, you know, things like mm -hmm. that. Is there anything that you apply from the modifieds that apply to the cup racing today? I, I think it's, you know, the fundamentals of what you said, you know, the, the, the level of detail, the effort that you're willing to put into it. Right. Um, but, you know, I mean, they're they're so different in, in, the, in the way that they – they race and set up. I mean, they are still a race car, right? There's four springs and wedge and, and, and bars. But, um, outside of that, I think it's just, it's just really, um, you know, the, the, the way you're brought up and, and the level of detail, these cars, the cup cars today are, are so finicky and so fine that it's, it's, you can go right past what's good and what's bad by making what you would have thought was a normal change back in the days. Um, they're so right height sensitive and, and things of nature. So they're, you really got to slow things down now with these cars and little change, but body rake, um, things of that nature, front heights, you know, splitter height is, is, you know, big balance changes. So they're, they're, this new car is, is quite a bit different. It's, is it more engineering now than it ever has been? Well, it's, it's way more engineering from the, from, we spent a lot of time in the simulator. We spent a lot of time with simulation. So we're, 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 we're working you know, like other forms of racing have been for a few years of, of and, and the whole the whole series has um, really, really, really put a lot of resources into that because now we don't have, we don't have testing. You know, we'd go and test for three days. We went to, to Darlington with, I think, 33 sets of tires for three days back in the day with Tony and you jack it up and you put spindles and lower control arms on it and put a set of tires on and go run a 30 lap rate, you know, go make a 30 lap run and see where it was. Come back in change a rear and housing and this and that and, put, and and go that that's how we did our our testing and development back then now it's all it's all it's all you know it's all done on a, on a computer and, and a simulation so you know it, it's changed and processes are, are so different from what they once were that was going to be my next question is everything now <laughs> relied on the sim pretty much everything really? i mean our ride heights are every quarter rounds we're talking you're running making a sim run to to, to, to see what it did from up you know yes it you raise the nose or you lower the nose. What did it do to bar load? What do I got to do to this? What do I got to, you know, it's a, it's a big box now that, that everything's kind of connected and, and, and you got to get it all right. It's just amazing how, uh, and, and I, and I don't mean to, to downgrade it by ba like calling it a video game, <laughs> but it's essentially like a video game translating into real world situations. How, close to real world situations are we getting with this sim um i mean like us as a group have spent a lot a lot of time and, and, and dedicated to the to the to the simulator where our drivers go in every week and and we try setups and things and and you know we're we're has come so far and there's some weeks we unload and my, and, and our drivers will be like man that felt just like the simulator and there's other weeks they're like that's horrible it wasn't even close right and and you're off and you're, 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 there's so much because you're, you're looking at, you know, from the tire model, which you only have so much data. So that's really hard. So you're trying to fit that tire, that tire model. You're trying to get that, that driver's feedback of, did it feel that way so that you can make your changes, um, and, and, and then get the feedback for the, the big picture of it. Right. And then it's, and then it's taking that and it's putting it into the simulation of where you're putting the shocks and the springs and the ride heights and, and all of those things in there and you're and you're you know that's what you're, you know you're kind of coming up with that recipe and you bring it back to the simulator and you try it and then you take it to the racetrack and you're you know what i mean so it's come a long long way in the last probably three to five years i mean it's crazy how far it really is the technology yeah it's 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 amazing um skipping uh changing gears here quick a uh, little bit uh We've seen a lot of the Cup guys now returning to the modifieds in one form or another. We've seen, 
Tommy Baldwin now with uh, racing his own team again with his kids. Uh, Which is awesome to see. They're doing well, too. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Luke and Jack, two very talented drivers. Um, we're now seeing Ryan Newman winning in the Smart Modifieds. We've got Bobby Labonte, you know, loving the Modified, mm -hmm. saying that this is one of the most fun things I've ever done. Do you ever kind of get that itch to kind of go check out a, a smart modified race or go tinker with a, a modified again or play around again? I love to go watch them. Because there's got to be some things you've learned <laughs> now that you can oh, apply. Oh, you, you wish. You, yeah, you, <laughs> right? you, you, know, you could go back in time, right? right. Um, I, I love to watch the modified races and, and, and stuff. But, I mean, from a time, like, I, I don't I don't have right. time to go tinker with anything. Maybe next year I will. I don't know what, 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 what my future will bring. So... Um, I do love it. I still have a big passion for it. I, I, some days I wish I was still back in the eighties, early nineties <laughs> racing modifies because we had, we had so much fun. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, just, it was just such good people. You race so hard and then you light a big bonfire in Stafford parking lot and you'd hang out <laughs> with, with the people you just raced against and you wanted to joke them 30 minutes ago, right? Cause you were banging wheels and now you're sitting out there drinking beer, hanging out, having fun. And it, that was just the, the fellowship and the the fun and things were, were different you know now it's as soon as that race is over you're on an airplane you're home you're back to work on monday you're you know what i mean it's just it, it, it's just different it's, worlds it's work it's yeah yep. it's it's your job now no yep. i i get it and i but uh i know what you mean the uh the the sitting around the campfire is one of the things that i do miss a lot of that i that i haven't gotten to do in a while you know especially after this weekend after my nephew won because i know that they were partying after, <laughs> i know they were partying after the way after the race it was a long time uh coming but um for you is there anything else that you want to do in the sport i mean you always want to do you know want to do more or you know continue to uh, accomplish things but um, I, I, I'm, I'm content where I'm at and what I've done. I've, I've had a, I mean, honestly, I've, I've, I've been blessed to, you know, like I said, to work with some of the greatest in the, in the, in the, in the sport and have had some, uh, you know, great opportunities and, and, um, I, I just like racing. I like showing up on Friday and, you know, judging yourself or your group, um, on Sunday when you get on the airplane and, and, and seeing where you need to work and improve and you know it, it's changed i do miss the a big part of me still wishes i'd stayed on the box longer because i i just miss that a, a, i'm an adrenaline junkie and and i really miss that part of the day sunday's making those calls where we're now in that transition when i came over to to, to Stuart haas and to, you know tony was was on me for a long time to come over and help and you know kind of just keep an eye on his side of the the business and, and things and um i felt like it would give me more time and and um maybe the next chapter in my life and it really didn't give me any more time off it because it, it you know i was still going i've gone to every race um every test and when you get two cars three cars four cars you actually find yourself going you know even more at times um so that was a little bit different of, of, from a transition for me and i still i, I still i still miss that the moments of you know you could judge yourself leaving that racetrack every every Sunday and how you did personally based on your calls and the car you prepared and brought to the racetrack and you know you could give yourself a, a, a grade and know what you needed to work on now it's a it's a bit different it's it's you know you can have three good cars and one has a bad day because it has a bad pit stop and that's your problem and that's what you're working on or you can you know we sat um at Tom uh at uh I remember this one <laughs> Talladega we qualified one, two, three, four, and I had drivers bitching because they were fourth and not on the pole, you know. And you know, we won that race, and they were within it like two ten. We we ran one, two, three, four for almost the entire day back, and and it's like you can't. At that point, I'm like, I just I just need to let some stuff go because it's it's right. that, that's exactly how it's always going to be. It's never going to change. There is it's it's their problem is your problem, and that's 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 part of it, you know. So you. You kind of have to think differently and and be a little more open minded and 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 things. And it took me a, a little bit to kind of adjust and and to, you know to learn thousands of a second yeah. off of each other, and they're still bitching, right? A one hundred percent. Yeah, races are racers, right? They never they never stop complaining. Yep. That's funny. But um, is it the uh, is it like you said the adrenaline rush of being on the, the box? Is it that 
making the right call? Is it that getting the right stop or, or a strategy working out your way? Well, yeah, it was a combination of all of it, right? Because at yeah. the end of the day, when the checker flag dropped, you 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 kind of grade yourself on whether you're two tire, four tire, whether you stayed out too long, or you you know what I mean. Your adjustments weren't good or, or, or you know proper, the right the right direction. Um, you 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 you. I mean, you learned it, you saw it immediately, you know. Um, now you're just following, you know, we got four cup cars, two Xfinity teams. So you're, I mean, you're, I'm, I'm just moving, there's moving parts, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's, most of it's people because the sport, um, most sports and businesses, right, are all about people. And in and, and, and motorsports, it's it, it's everything, you know, it's, it's people working together, believing in each other, having each other's backs, um, and, and supporting in the same direction. And direction. Yep. Yeah. And, and that that's that's huge. So <clears throat> somebody's always not happy and it's trying to keep that one happy to to to, to you know to be part of that puzzle in that in that direction of, of, of going in the right way. Was was there any race in your career, <clears throat> and this can be from modifieds all the way up to now, where you won the race and said to yourself, there's no way we should have won th that race or there was just things that had gone wrong that you thought there's no way we should have won that race and you won it? Well, I think there's always those races, right? Because there's always those races that um, you should have won. Like we should have won 80 races. And and me being young, Tony being young, we, we lost a lot more than we won because we didn't, we were learning how to race. Mm -hmm. You know, so you you... Or something happens one day, you know what I mean? You, you you lead the whole thing and then you have a bad pit stop or you, you know, you blow a motor and you, you I mean, it was, it was, you know, there's always those. So, you know, I was a believer that you just stay positive and, and you'll get some of those back that you, you didn't deserve that. You know what I mean? You, you had a top two, three, four car. You did everything right all day. And that's kind of what it is today is you have to, you, you have to really work hard at keeping yourself in the position to win. And when you have that opportunity, you know, execute. And when it's that last restart, whether it's that last pit stop, whether it's that, you know, whatever that is, is, is these are hard to win today. You 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 gotta you gotta do everything right all day long. All the little things you stack, all those little things to get to the big one. You you, you mentioned Eddie Flemke, you know, guys like Reggie. I mean, what craftsmen? You, you know what I mean? The guys that could to build their own stuff. You, you know. Um, what was what was Eddie Flemke like? I never knew Eddie Flemke Senior or anything. What was, do you know? Do you know him well? Oh, they were all you know great racers, and, and and then Junior, you know, he was building cars and 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 fabricating, and and um, you know him and Reggie got together, and then um, Reggie still works still works at Stuart Haas right. and uh, uh, doing the Xfinity uh, interiors and stuff, you know. So it's great to see him uh, to see him around and and every day, and uh, he's still still. Plugging along, man. Loves loves working on race cars. Now, switching back to, to the modified stuff, um, were you guys building your own chassis back then? Because uh, when it was the the twelve car, the Vega, when uh, Ron was in it, was was that there uh, was a there was a mixture back then. There was, um, you know, we were chassis dynamics cars for for a bit in the earlier in the earlier days when we were really racing every week, and when Brett was there, mm -hmm. and um, when Mikey showed up. He wanted a, a Richie car, and Uncle Billy did not like the Richie car. He didn't like that hoop in the front. He didn't like, the, you know, the, the, you know, like you said, the, the, uh, our modified the number twelve Sherwood Industries car was always one of the prettiest cars, and I mean, it it could be chromed. It was chromed, even if it slowed you down, right? It was all <laughs> about, you know what I mean, the the, the level of detail, yeah. um, and uh, said how much wrong. clear coat was on that thing, and and how many times you wet sanded it and buffed it, and they were they were always. They were always beautiful. Um, so Mikey pushed and pushed and built up. We he went to up to Richie's and and built our first like a copy. And he had made some changes and shortened the cage and did some did some stuff. But it it, it was like a a copy of a Richie car. And then and then um, we raced those. And then we then when um, Eddie Flumke and were, was building the that that modified we had in the latter days we had uh, we had we raced both of them. Because oh, I, I I thought. Um... <clears throat> Brett was also in one of the, the RE cars when when he ran uh, the twelve. Man, I'd have to go back and think. I don't I don't know if we had one back then. That's but, man, we're going back to mid eighties. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> and, I've lost some brain cells and, since then. Yeah, <laughs> we were talking about it at the beginning of the show too. That car is still over in Mike McLaughlin's shop too. It's it's still yeah, there. That's the way we uh, just the way we we raced it. It's 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 set back there. I think I. 
we damaged the quarter panel or something on it. I painted the quarter panel and it's it, and put it and was putting it back together and it's still it, it's still sitting um, just just the way we 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 ran. A, a bunch of years ago, we went to interview Max McLaughlin when uh, he was running the dirt modifieds uh, before the the late model stuff came along, and I just met him at the shop and walked in and. <laughs> There's the potato wagon sitting yeah. there. There's the Coors Extra Gold car sitting in the other corner. I, you know, and then immediately the 12 year old kid in me kicks in, and you know I'm <laughs> fanboying out. So, and I'm working for Speed Sport at the time, so I'm just click 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 click, click <laughs> snapping pictures of the car, um, which actually t- turned out to have a, another purpose because, um, do you know uh, the guy? Any of the guys over at PSR chassis, the 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 new modified guys that are over in North Carolina here, uh, they called me because I do some of their video work for them, they called and asked if I had any pictures of the Coors Extra Gold car because they, oh, have, really? they have a customer that is having a, uh, a modified built for them, but the body they're hanging it, uh, the body they're hanging on it is the the, the Coors Extra no Gold way. That's pretty cool. body, yeah, with the the The, curve, the rounded nose the and everything. The rounded yep. nose and everything. Yeah, they called me and they asked me, do you know where <laughs> you know, we can find pictures of the car? And I had had them in my phone from interviewing Max and... Yeah, they're gonna make like a a, a show car, or a, he's gonna run one of those vintage modified oh, series cool. around here, and it's gonna yeah. be yeah a, a replica of the car. Yeah, I'll. Uh, they already cut the the panels out, and they showed me and everything. I'll I'll I'll, hmm, I'll that's show pretty you. Pretty cool. Those guys over there, they're they're they really some good cars. They're excelling quickly in the world of modified racing. I mean, for the years it was just Troyer. Everything was yep. Troyer this, Troyer that, and uh, well then, LFR slash Fury yep. came along. And now the PSR has been winning everything. I mean, they won the championship at Bowman Gray the last two years, and they've won, I think, almost every race on the Smart Modified Tour uh, now. Are there any modified guys that you look at now that you you like and you admire and you think they're doing incredible stuff? I mean, I think there's 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 always good young, you know what I mean, <clears throat> talented. It seems like... Um... I don't follow it as close as, as you know, I, I kind of wish I had time to or stuff, but it um, seems to me like there's kind of an error of, of, of guys that have been in it for a while that are still doing, you know what I mean, doing well. I mean, obviously, it's fun to see Tommy and, and see him at the racetrack. Obviously, him and I are, are, are within a year apart, and we, I mean, grew up from very, very young ages at the racetrack every weekend hanging out and racing and competing against each other and stuff, so... Um, it, it's really cool to see his 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 boys. Um, I mean, they're they're excelling. I, I feel like they're doing really really well for the amount of time they've had uh, in, in in a race car. So I'd Both say they're them. yeah. I would say that they're they they might be the two the two diamonds in the, in the in the series. You know. Yeah, for sure. Um, what do you call it? Neil Cantor, his crew chief, who was actually my old crew chief when I ran on dirt. He said that th- this this kid's unbelievable, you know. And he and he comes and he works on the cars too. Then that's the other. That's thing. really cool. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that was going to be my next question. What is your take about the the just showing up in the driving? Because you know, there's there's few guys that can mm-hmm. now that can get out of the car and work on it and put it together. Um, I mean, Pre- Ryan Priest, who's driving for you guys, Josh Berry, they're guys that can get out of the car and work yep. on it and turn wrenches. And then there are others that have no idea what they're doing and they just hop in it and make it go. I, I don't, I mean, I think there's a, there's, there's pros and cons to both of it, right? There, there's, there's guys that I think have a little bit different, maybe appreciation because they did it and they worked on it. Um, but it doesn't, I don't know that it necessarily makes them a better, uh, any better or worse of a driver, right? Um, than maybe the guys that, that grew up driving, I racing and sim and learned how to drive and, and race and they're competitive, right? It's 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 a different era. I mean, I think there was a time when if you didn't have that guy that could get out and work on the car and help or just you know understand the amount of uh, work and, and detail it took to to get it to that point, it was different. Now, I mean, it is it's, it's a different world we're you know that we're living. So it, it's it's if I was if I was sitting there trying to hire somebody. Would it matter? I mean, it would. It would. It would really just, I think, matter. Of, are they talented enough to, to 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 run at a road course, a speedway, an intermediate? You know, they have that skill set is is probably more important than can they actually get out and help you change a steering rack or you know what I mean, transaxle right. in well, the car. because you have the staff now that can take <clears throat> exactly care of, can, can take care of that stuff. Okay, one question I got to ask you, um, and I only watched it because I saw it on TV. 
what happened in Chicago with the fight between the 20 <laughs> team and the Dodge uh, team? Because <clears throat> I'm looking at Tommy Baldwin and you, and I'm like, wait a minute, two modified guys, and I know they must know each other from over the years. Oh God, what we, the hell we, happened we, that day? We've been good, good, good friends. Are you know, honestly, since seven years old, I think you know, eight years old. Right. Um, it was a restart, and and I think um, if you ask Tony. Um, uh, the nine car was a little slow on the restart and spun his tires and Tony went and, you know, if you ask the other one, Tony was a little aggressive, I guess. So they did, we just got together on a restart and, and, and um, uh, Casey King got, got spun there and uh, we were racing for the lead and, um, you know, as it went, it was just one of those, those, those racing, uh-huh. racing deals. And then the next thing you know, you know, the, the, the passionate New Englander, Long Islander came out and down in the pit box, here comes Tommy hollering at me. I'm like, dude, I'm not driving the car. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Right. You know, but no, it was all, it was all good. But yeah, those, again, those are the good, you don't even see that stuff anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, it was, I can't tell you how many times we had. Did he grab, did he grab you? And he was trying to down? get up on the pit box. And um, someone yeah. yanked, because yeah. the next thing I know, I see the shot of him with his suit <laughs> halfway up and he's like scratched yeah. up on his side. Uh, One of the crew guys grabbed him and dragged him down off the box there or whatever oh, and then man. the officials were there so i mean it was never any it was just a you know Dude, good good times man the the ball you don't want to mess with the baldwins <laughs> okay because well first off you remember when the old man got shot right and, and he still went after the guys that were yeah. tom tommy t- was telling me that story uh on here it sounded like a freaking action movie you know because he got shot and he still went after the guys that were trying to rob him and <laughs> that, that man was oh he was funny he he was that was a passionate, fun guy to be around. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> good, good, good times back in the days there. You got Mr. Any, Baldwin, you, yeah. You got any funny stories with Baldwin? I can't tell him on the air. Oh, no, we're they're, an R-rated <laughs> show. You, you can tell him on the air. We're, this is an R-rated show. <laughs> no, I just the, the only one that is goes back to when we went to Martinsville. Um, we were all we had to do was start the race to win the championship. And we were all we were all staying in uh, in Martinsville at the Dutch, and Tommy was there, and we were there, and and we went to we we did stuff that night that we we shouldn't have done, and and just having fun, you know, um, rental car stories and smoke bombs, and I'm going through the parking lot and smoke, you know, I don't remember the big guy, but <laughs> him and I were in the back seat, and somebody throws a smoke bomb in there, and the two in the front to get out of the car, leave it in gear, and we're driving the cars going across the parking lot at the Dutch. And we can't get out of the back seat because <laughs> smoke's pouring out of the thing, and <laughs> and then uh, we all went up and we had some fun on a, on a, on a, on, a, on a drinking some beers, and next thing you know, somebody threw something over the railing at the car, and some damage happened, and you know it was just one of those one of those crazy 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 nights, and we're like the next day we're like all we had to do, I mean like if anybody got hurt or something happened, you you know what I mean? We had to start, so we didn't get nobody cared, right? Right. We went to all shucks and McLaughlin was jumping on tables and glass was flying <laughs> everywhere. And it was like, what? <laughs> Wait, real quick though, did the car crash into anything? It was still in gear and rolling. Well, let's just put it this way. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the short version of this one. Um, the uh, rental car place came the next day with a flatbed and picked it up and dropped us <laughs> off a new one. Um, so. <laughs> My God. Yeah, I don't think I still can't rent a uh, rental rental car now they, oh you know, my joking, god that one wasn't in my name but um yeah it was it, it, it was pretty funny some of the some of the days but tommy was there that night with us having a oh having a big god. time and 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 um it, it was all harmless fun and it just you know what i mean you get <clears throat> you get going and somebody starts it and the next thing you know you know what i mean right but uh it was all and then you look back and you fun. go oh, what the hell were we thinking, thinking yeah right <laughs> you try to tell your kids you know you you can't get away with that stuff today yeah, you yeah. Know, especially with all the social media mm-hmm. and, and yeah. all of that. I mean, thank we, God there wasn't social media back when me and McLaughlin were growing up. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now this everyone is under a microscope. You know, there's this cameras everywhere. I, I get it. But uh, we are getting close to the end of the show. Uh, we totally appreciate you coming on. This was a lot of fun. Uh, this is by far <laughs> the biggest guest we've ever had on the show. Okay. Uh, is there anything that you want to plug, you want to promote, where we can watch uh, your show, um, you know, things like that? No, I just appreciate you having me on. And, and um, if there are any hunters out there, you know, uh, Drop Zone TV, it's on the Outdoor Channel. Mm-hmm. It airs uh, uh, five times a, a week. Um, obviously, 
social media um, is, is is a big following. We started talking about that, and in and in, in, in the hunting industry, the that platform is is the same thing. It's just we social media, social media. I'm like I've I have someone full time. That's all they do is social media for Drop Zone. Yeah. That's how crazy it is, and, and how it's it's growing today and 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 stuff. So, but no, I, this is great times. You know, kind of reminiscent about some of the the, the, the good old days, and uh, appreciate you having me. Ah, oh, we appreciate you being here. Our biggest thing is we want the guests to come on and and have a good time and have fun. But uh, yes, Greg, thank you for yeah, thank you for, very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Greg Zipidelli joining us on the Derek Pernasiglio show. We want to thank him for joining us. And remember, follow us on our YouTube channel at the Derek Pernasiglio Show. You can also find us on Facebook at the same name. And then you can also locate us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Real DP Show. So for Greg Zipidelli, I'm Derek Pernasiglio for saying thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you the next time. Bye.